you know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Welcome, everyone, to Chasing Giants, episode 182, I believe, Don. We're just almost on the cusp of mid-August. Fall food plot season is around us. We got a lot going on, but we teed this up with Joe Miles on the podcast last week. You're going to go into buck management plans on this episode, and I'm really excited to hear what you got to say. Um, You know, buck management is... uh, As everybody's kind of picking out their target buck, you've talked about before that buck management is uh, also trying to choose what bucks to cull. So we're going to take care of that. But before we get to that, you just came in from the field glassing, and uh, let's hear how your evening went because you came straight in, got in the shower, and then got on the screen. So how did that go tonight? It went pretty good. Um, I seen uh, I seen Babe tonight. he was too far away to, sh- to uh, get good video footage of. He was actually the farthest deer away that I seen. I seen three little bucks, a little year and a half old bucks. And then I seen a couple of does, but, uh, it was a pretty good evening uh, for deer movement, but I just didn't get any video footage of the ones I wanted. Right. So, so uh, how about go ahead. I was going to say, how about, uh, this is the, probably the latest in the, at the evening that we have ever recorded a podcast, I think. And, yeah. uh, you had a busy day too. So I haven't, I even, had a, we didn't even take a chance to visit before we got on here. So kind of curious yeah, how you, your day went. We usually talk a little bit beforehand, but, um, I guess, I guess I was blessed, uh, to be pulled into a situation with Lester's feet today. Um, and I mean blessed because we got to help a young lady that was in a really bad situation. But I'm telling you what, it's been a long time since my blood pressure has been as high as what it was today. And, um, you know, our foundation is set up to help mostly families with sick kids. But we also have specifically written in our bylaws that if we come across a situation that someone needs help and it's the right thing to do, that if the board agrees, we can, you know, do that. And uh, I got a phone call today that there was a young pregnant woman that had been abused by her husband and needed a place to get away from him. And there wasn't any options for her to stay. So I uh, left work, went over and was able to put a uh, extended stay hotel uh, in my name so she couldn't be found, stay safe while they're working through the legal system and everything. But, you know, Don, When I see a young pregnant lady get out of her car and walk over coming from a situation where she's been abused by a man, I don't know if it's the right or wrong thing to do, but the only thing I wanted to do at that point was get in my truck and go find him. I just, I I don't know if I'm right or I'm wrong, or if that's Satan with some, uh, you know, my temper and, and, and bad thoughts, but I'm telling you what, there's there's very few things I consider lower than a man who lays a hand on a woman. And for him to do that to a pregnant woman to where she doesn't even have but the clothes on her back. So um, for all the people that donate to Lester's Feet, I'm, I'm always going to be honest with you. We helped a family today that did not have a sick child. But I hope everybody understands that we also helped the lady get away from an abusive situation and got her safe. Uh, so we're protecting that that child. That unborn child is just as important as a as a child in ICU right now. But I'm telling you what, the the whole afternoon as I was dealing with this, and then had some ladies meet me to take her shopping for some clothes and some food. I haven't been this pissed off in a long time. 
<laughs> so that was pretty much wow. my whole evening tonight. Wow. Uh, we may find something to get you riled up about before the night's <laughs> over. I could. Usually it's me going on the rants, but maybe tonight we'll find something to poke you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tell you what, I'm just, uh, I, I feel really blessed that God opened up a door to connect us because, you know, that's not usually our wheelhouse where we connect it. So thank, I know we're here to talk about deer hunting, but for all those people who's ever bought a raffle ticket or, um, you know, supported us in any way, I mean, even, even liking this, uh, and contributing and watching this podcast helps Lester's feet. Everything that we do inside of Higgins outdoors, uh, goes some way back to supporting Lester's feet. So, um, we're, we were blessed to be able to be connected with this lady and be able to help. And I want to thank everybody uh, for participating in that. And uh, she's sleeping in a safe place tonight. Well, good deal. Uh, but I tell you what, in our prayers. Yeah, she uh, she's going to have a rough road ahead of her. So but I tell you, last night I got home from work. Um, you know, I'm running so far behind with some habitat projects. And luckily, the farm that I'm working on right now um you know, I'm still working on it because there's not a shooter on it, but Austin Razor's coming down tomorrow and we're actually going to set a 360 blind. So today, or yet last night, I spent the night putting together the tower for the blind so we can haul it over there today. And I was planning on doing it tonight. Well, I'm glad that I didn't do that because I wouldn't have had time. So we got a full day of work mm -hmm. ahead tomorrow that uh, we'll be able to talk about a little bit uh, later in the, I guess, next episode. So big day ahead on the projects on the farm tomorrow. Well, you got some good help coming anyway. I'm telling you, Austin helped me a few times this spring, and uh, that young man gets with the program now. There's no grass he's growing gonna, under his feet. He's going to work circles around me. I can <laughs> guarantee you that. <laughs> Well, you definitely did so, me. But yeah, but other than that, it's been a big week. Uh, did I saw that you posted on social media that you actually, out of all these times, you said people are too early planning fall food plots. I see you go on social media and say that you're planning uh, the second week of August. So I know people take you very black and white. And so you might as well take this opportunity to kind of explain the logic on why you plan it a little bit earlier than normal this year, because you're about three weeks ahead of when you normally say it. Yeah, I am. But what I planted was just a plot topper, which is a brassica mix. And it doesn't hurt that to go in a little bit early. The, the reason that you typically don't want to plant your fall plots early is most fall blends have cereal grains in them, oats, wheat, rye, barley, whatever. And those, if you plant them too early, will get uh, too mature and they lose all their palatability. Um, the brass is that's not the case. And I just had uh, uh, the uh, grain sorghum test plot that, you know, it had some, some bare spots, some spots where, you know, the sunlight was hitting the ground. And I'm always trying to make the, the most of every square foot of plot space I got. And we had a rain coming, so I thought, hey, you know what, it, it ain't going to hurt to get this in the ground a couple of weeks early. And I went out and I broadcast it right before rain, and, you know, it ought to come up shortly. And it, it's really been, um, well, I mean, last fall was super, super dry. After we planted, hardly got any rain whatsoever on the fall plots. And I've said this many times. I have never seen a year yet where you have a bad spring and a bad fall growing conditions. And, you know, this spring was terrible, but it was so dry. But it seems like we're in a rain pattern now where we're, we're getting steady rains. We've got some ground moisture. So uh, I think the fall plots ought, ought to be fine. Now, the rest of my plots, I'm probably going to wait about uh, till that last week of August uh, around the Labor Day weekend to get them in. But I, I just uh, broadcast that plot topper um, in, in that grain sorghum plot and also in one of my uh, Nutri-Crave corn plots. And, and I have no idea how well it's going to do in there. It was more of an experiment than anything. Well, you know, it's just people take, you know, sometimes we even forget what we say during an episode two days later and people ask us a question about it. And I don't even remember saying it. But people take us so literally. I think the takeaway for me for everything we talk about fall plots is around the beginning of August, you get that plot ready and you get it prepped and you get the weeds under control 
And then as you start getting into mid August, depending on what you're planning, you're ready to rock and roll based on that weather forecast. But if you wait till the end of August to get your plot ready, you know, your weeds aren't terminated properly and you're going to end up shortchanging yourself. You know, I know you were on Team Radicals podcast here recently and Kyle even posted a video today uh, from Team Radical saying the exact same thing. He said, you know, these cereal grains, if you plant them too early, and I've seen people planting stuff in mid-July because Mm -hmm. they think they want foot tall plots on opening day. But when it comes to cereal grains, I'd rather take that young tender growth every single day of the week. And everybody gets hung up on opening day. Well, you know, opening day is one day. And uh, it, let's say your your plot is absolutely prime on opening day. Well, what's it going to be 30 days later? You get towards Halloween, it's going to be 30 days past prime. So mm-hmm. I would like for that prime window to be later Um you know, when we're going to be doing more hunting than we are there in the early season when we're typically hunting cold fronts and, and evenings only. Yeah. And, and to people's defense, you know, guys that have a lot of diversity, like you were glassing babe in a soybean field tonight. You know, we both have a lot of soybeans in our, in our programs because we're planning diversity. The guys that only have one food plot and they're sitting there with bare dirt with nothing to eat, I think that's part of what creates a lot of anxiety that I got to get something out there. I got to get something out there. So I appreciate where people are coming from when they're trying to do the right thing. It's just a little bit more strategy will probably help you with attraction later on in the season. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, those guys that are sitting there with bare plots, if they would put those plots in soil charge in the spring, it's really going to help cut down the weed competition and it's going to add nutrients to the soil. It's going to give those deer something to eat through the spring and the summer. Real benefit to going ahead and planting that soil charge in the spring, even if you plan on doing something like Deadly does and harvest salad, plot top or whatever in the fall. Right. You know, because if that's the case, you really only end up with maybe a week or two where nothing's in there when you terminate it and then get ready for a fall. And there's right. always, you know, planting a little clover strip around the outside of it and keeping that in a perennial um, clover just so there's something there mm-hmm. for them to eat. So just something to think about. I know that that raised some eyebrows by people based on the comments that I saw. We always get some of the funny comments on your social media posts, but it's uh, it yeah. is what it is, but I just wanted to explain that a little bit more on the podcast tonight. Yeah, it's probably a good thing we did. It, it doesn't matter what I do; somebody's not going to be happy with it. So All I've right. been dealing well, with haters I, about every day this week. Yep. Yeah. Well, before I forget, uh, we're going to get carried away with this buck management. I want to, uh, for the people watching on YouTube right now, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, there's a big event in Napanee, Indiana on uh what is it september 12th i believe i think that's the date yep yep september 12th and i'm going to be speaking in it along with a couple others this is the fifth annual hunters bash and it's going to start at three o'clock and go through nine o'clock at night there's going to be dinner a lot of food entertainment um a bunch of auction items and raffles but our friends at Tag Out have done this and drove in big, big crowds for uh, for several years. You've spoken at this, I believe. But the beauty of this thing is, is it's all for charity. And they contacted me and asked me if I'd come up and do something for Lester's feet. And I said, absolutely. And we started talking about, uh, you know, uh, the proceeds of it. And uh, instead of doing all of the donations to Lester's feet, I actually requested that the proceeds from this actually help some families that are in need in Napanee area. So uh, one of the cool things about the Amish and Mennonite community is how they st- you know stand behind and help their community. So um, I was I was really tickled that a lot of the proceeds of this are going to very specific needs in their community and uh that's what it's all about really happy for it but the big thing that we need everybody to do is we need you to rsvp by september 1st so rsvp by september 1st and i'm going to give you a phone number for the people who are not watching on youtube 
It's 574-209-2065. And uh, we hope that you guys will come out. I know um, I know uh, several of our friends from even over in Ohio are going to make the trip over, and I really appreciate their support. But uh, admission is a donation. There's going to be raffle tickets, ton of food. But uh, let's all get together if you're around Michigan, Ohio, northern Indiana, and help a family out. Uh, we really – Really appreciate the guys from Tag Out doing this event every year for charity. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think I spoke at either the first or the second one they ever had. And and you're going to have great food. That's one thing you can just count on. There's going to be great food complete with homemade ice cream. At least there was every when I was there. And just about every Amish event that I go to, they have ice cream. So, uh, But the thing of it is the people there, first class people, I mean, very friendly, very community oriented, and uh, just to be a good time and for a good cause. If you're within driving distance of that event, you really ought to try to get there. Yeah, I'm going to give the phone number one more time. It's 574 209 2065. We need your RSVP by September 1st, and I'm assuming that's so they can plan the food. So, again, September 12th at the Claywood Event Center in Napanee, Indiana. So hope to see everybody there. Um, one more housekeeping thing uh, while we're doing housekeeping stuff. Pre-orders for the Chasing Giants TV t-shirt are going to close here in the next week. Uh, we've gotten a bunch of orders, really appreciate it. But this is just another way that we're raising money for the foundation. Um, Don and I decided to do a little bit different pro staff type shirt instead of talking about promotional we did it as far as our beliefs and core values and uh so far a lot of people have complimented on the design like it nice t-shirt so 25 dollars including shipping go to curryinc.com to purchase that and they also have some other lester's feet um apparel on there that you can order all proceeds go to the foundation so pretty cool yeah it is i'm gonna you send me that uh photo of that shirt terry i want to share it on my social media tomorrow okay yep sounds good speaking of sharing did you uh did you happen to see the big burnout <laughs> i did see the big burnout uh you yeah talk i about hope chris yates didn't i hope chris yates didn't see the big burnout you was for those who didn't see it terry was on uh chasing giants tv youtube channel had his victory um gmc out there and he had the back wheels of smoking so uh i'm just shaking my head thinking man i hope chris yates don't see this one <laughs> i told him i said i might need to uh, add a uh, tire subsidy to my next trade-in because i probably burn a little bit off on that on that uh photo shoot but we wanted to do um selfishly don you and i get so many messages what's the deal with the victory Chevrolet deal, you know? And, uh, I feel guilty just saying, here's the number call. And, you know, because, you know, mm -hmm. people, people, I think, you know, want to talk to us about our experience with it and is it worth it? So, but it's, it's exhausting us having to type it out every time. So we basically made a video that, actually shares an Excel spreadsheet where you actually go through the deal and uh, compare buying a truck normally versus buying Chris Yates's program and tried to explain it the best I could. But to get a little bit of an attention getter, we did a, about a, I don't know, 250 foot burnout with, uh, with the truck. So. <laughs> well, I, I could have kept up with you when I was 16, 17 years old. I'd go through a set of tires about every three months, and today I don't. I try not to spin them. No, nope. I guess I'm getting old. Well, it'll it'll spin them, that's for sure. But uh, but anyway, uh, go over into the uh, Chasing Giants TV YouTube channel if you want to see that. I'm really um, I really want to thank everybody who's gone over and subscribed. Um, you know, we we probably didn't explain it real well, but again, this other outlet that we're doing that's got a big variety of videos that we've made so far. I think there's in the last two weeks, there's about uh, 17 videos, I believe, 
and they're all over the place. And we're trying to play around with the YouTube algorithms. But if we can get that thing rolling, the plans we have to back feed uh, that into Lester's Feet Foundation is going to grow exponentially. And when I say exponentially, I mean the number of families that we're going to help. So, um, you know, I, I know that a lot of people watch YouTube, but you don't subscribe. Please, if you could do me a favor and go over to that channel and click subscribe. Um, I don't care if you watch the videos or not. I hope you find them entertaining, but if you don't, it's fine. Um, but this thing, I want this thing to really grow and almost be an annuity for the foundation. You know, it, it, it has the potential if it takes off and we're producing content that's going to help hunters or land managers, but it also feeds an income to the foundation. That's really cool. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited if we can get this thing off the ground, if you, everybody will help us. Yeah, you've got a lot of subscribers already. So um, hopefully all the listeners will take your advice and go over there and do that for a good cause. Yep. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. I want to save as much time as we can for buck management. So we're going to take a quick break with Osseo and then be right back. Osseo Gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched, pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations. Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit osseogear.com. That's A-S-I-O gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear, prepare to be invisible. All right, Don, we're back. This is the most anticipated segment that I've had all summer. Because not only are you still probably mulling over the decision of what to do with Babe now that you've got your eyes on him, there's also some other decisions that you have to make as far as buck management. And I think people are going to be surprised at maybe some of the strategies or things that you're planning on doing. But before you get into that, tee up a little bit before we get into it about what you're referring to as buck management so that everybody's on the same page of understanding uh, what this this idea and theory for the farm this year is going to be. Well, you know, I used to talk about culling bucks and, and still do to some degree, but the term culling is so misunderstood that I've, I've started talking more about buck management and how you manage the, the bucks on your property. And you know, here in the last year or so, I've actually t probably two years, I put a lot of effort into the habitat on my farm. Uh, I planted trees, I planted more switchgrass, I've added acreage, I've done TSI cuts, um, just, you know, one thing after another um, to make the habitat the best that it can be on my farm. But if I don't manage the, the deer that are on this farm to the best of my ability as well, that habitat work is really going to kind of be wasted because you know, I'm going to be at just the mercy of mother nature and, and, you know, what happens, um, just naturally with, with the bucks, especially. So uh, I'm going to ratchet up my buck management a, a couple of notches and I'm going to start culling if you will, or maybe I should just say, I'm going to start shooting more management bucks than I ever have in the past. And if, uh, you know, I haven't shot a buck period in two years. Well, that with a two buck limit in Illinois, that's four tag, four buck tags that did not get used that could have been used on this farm. And I, I'm going to take a lot of guests. Um, my two grandsons are actually going to hunt this year for the youth season. The youth season there is a, I think it's the second weekend in October. Um, going to have both them here hunting. Hopefully they can shoot bucks. Um, uh, my son-in-law, I'm sure, will be back, uh, and who, who knows who else will be a guest. Terry, <laughs> Terry's got his hand up. So, <laughs> I, I, if I only shoot five bucks, I think five bucks off my farm this year would be the bare minimum, and I probably want to shoot six or seven, maybe even more than that. I, I want to hammer that buck herd. Um, but the goal uh, is there. Good. The goal there is the ones you want to leave are the ones with potential. 
So the, the thing, you know, go ahead. I was going to say the thing of it is right now, I, I've got a better crop of upcoming young bucks than I've ever had. And I didn't even realize some of these bucks that I had in this summer. It's like, wow, he's a good one. There's a good one. I probably got about five bucks that are three to five years old that I, I want to live. And the only way that I'm, the more of the other older bucks that I can kill, the better my odds of keeping more of those bucks alive. Now, I don't expect all five of them to be alive at the end of the season. You know, surely one or two or more is going to wander off and get killed or whatever. Sure. But I'm going to try to do my part by killing the older age class bucks. And by that, I mean three and a half and older that do not have the potential of these ones that, that I want to live. So at this point, even though your property, I'm going to put you kind of on the spot here. I'm just curious. Even though your property is as good as it is now and as good as it's going to be with all of these improvements three and five years from now, assuming that you're going to have a target buck that you want to shoot every year, are you to the point in your career where you go after one target buck and one management buck for your two? instead of what you've done the last couple years and that's just burn that tag because you didn't have a buck that you're necessarily willing to shoot i'm gonna have a lot less seasons where i didn't shoot anything there's no sense of having two buck tags in my pocket and having bucks on the farm that i want to get shot and you know every buck that comes along is not going to be a 200 inch buck he's not even going to yep. be a 170 inch buck yeah, right, I, I so, need to do my part as as part of that management, you know, and I have a lot of guests hunting here, but I, I spend more time on the farm than anybody. I have the, the most opportunity to kill them bucks as anybody. So yeah. I, I need to be doing my part and I'm going to notch things up and we're going to shoot some bucks. Well, I want to make sure people understand that the amount of guests that you and I have taken on your property um, you know, cause you know, Corey, your son-in-law, Wes and I are pretty much the only ones you turn loose that we, we will take guests, you know, if we got a sponsor or a kid or somebody that we want to come in there, um, the time that you're saying you didn't shoot bucks, you're trying to get other, other people, a buck of, you know, their lifetime that would achieve their goals, but it's still a management practice for you. So I want people to think that it's not that nobody's hunting your property the last couple of years. You pretty much have hunted almost every day, but it's been taking someone. And in, the, and in that case, it's a win-win because somebody's getting a, a buck that meets their goals, but it's also helping your farm. So I know every listener is sitting back asking you thinking about submitting a question on chasinggiants.com and that's going to be what happens when one of the grandsons is in that blind and you season and babe walks out at 25 yards. Um that's a good <laughs> question. We will, we will we will think about that. We will think well, about that. Don, uh, speaking from experience, and this is not probably apples and oranges from that situation, but my daughter's first buck was uh, mid 150s when she was 11 years old, and it was the worst thing that ever happened to her. So, um, well, you, you, you have to make the decision that you need to make. And we were stoked when she was 11 years old and dropped the hammer on a, a big, big Kentucky deer. But uh, it it pretty much ruined her and the perspective that she has for how much work to put into it. And um, just saying, it, it I don't I don't think it was the best thing for her to to come out of the gate and shoot a that that caliber of buck. Well, my young oldest grandson, he's already shot two bucks. Mm -hmm. So you know he's got a couple under his belt. But you're you're right when when they on their first buck and it's a giant it's all downhill from there that they, they expect that to happen every time they go to the woods they don't realize how rare that was so but looking back point. on it i wouldn't have told my daughter not to shoot i mean i couldn't have done right. that but you know look mm -hmm. also looking back on it and understanding her perspective you know then it, when she was 12 we had a 140 come out and she goes no he's too small 
<laughs> I mean, no, no perspective of it whatsoever. So I was like, do you realize how long I hunted before I shot a 140? That's what I was thinking. Boy, times have changed because I don't know how long I hunted before I even seen a 140. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the deer herd was a little bit different back then, Don. I think there was probably more variables to it. So, so as you're looking at trail camera pictures, are you going ahead and identifying those three, four, and five-year-olds that just need to be shot and following along with what you and Dr. Strickland talk about all the time. You're looking for eight pointers, probably no brow tines, small frames, that type of thing. Well, when it comes to eight pointers, I don't care what the size of the frame is. I got a five-year-old eight on my place right now with a giant frame. He's probably at least 170 inches. And to be honest, he's getting shot. I don't even care who shoots him. If he walks by anybody that's sitting on my farm, I want him shot. And I'm talking 170 inch eight point, a, a, an absolute giant, <laughs> but it, he's never going to get any better. He's as, he was as big last year. Yeah. Um, so he, he needs to go. I've just got some, some super, super young bucks. I got two six by six mainframes with extras that one of them's a three-year-old, one of them's a four-year-old. I've got a five by six, um, but then the best one of all, he's a five-year-old this year. You remember the big nine point two years ago? You ought to see him now. He, he's a he's a ten point instead of a nine, but he's got three brows on one side, two brows on the other, and I mean they are long. Th th those brows are probably about as long as his G twos. No kidding. And uh, yeah, he, he he's a dandy. He's probably, he's definitely over 170 inches and wow. maybe he's just well over 170, maybe even 180 with those brows. And he's a five-year-old though. So, you know, next year would be the year that I would typically target him. So, um, well, I'll tell you what, some good and, ones coming on. And, and I'm not trying to lay claim on him or anything, but out of all the bucks I know on your property, that eight pointer would be the one that it would be my, that would be the top one. I don't know what it is about giant eight pointers. I was out in Kansas years ago and saw a, a mid sixties to seventies, uh, eight pointer and just was in awe and hunted that deer for over a week and saw him twice and never got close enough. And man, do I just, I love big eight pointers. And problem is, is you get a you get a 170 or even one in the 160s eight pointer they're giants but they're just never going to peak that you know high booner category they just there's no way they can get there with only eight points right so um, yeah he, he's going and, and to be honest i don't care who shoots him he, but he needs shot the first time he's walks in front of somebody i don't want him to just keep going and then get to the end of the year then you can't get him in front of you when you um, mentioned that buck on last week's episode with Joe Miles, his eyes lit up and we weren't off the podcast 30 seconds. And he goes, send me pictures of that eight pointer. <laughs> yeah. And I'll throw something else out as we're talking about these bucks. Um, Steve Shields is going to be here in the next couple of weeks. We're going to film some more videos for the uh, Whitetail Master Academy. And I'll do something I've never done before. And I'm going to go through a lot of the bucks that I have on trail camera. And, you know, this one I think is however many years old. This one we're, we're going to let go. We don't want to shoot this one. Here's one that's X number of years old. This is one we're going to shoot. And, and we're going to look at a bunch of the bucks I got on, on camera this summer and uh, just go through them all to give people uh, kind of an idea of, of what I'm looking for and the kind of bucks that I'm letting go and the kind of bucks I'm shooting. Is that decision coming from just the point in your career where you're really, it's okay if you don't get one and that you've locked up enough of extra block of t uh, land that you don't have somebody setting the property line anymore, that you're uh, secure enough doing that? What's the reasoning behind doing that? Five years ago, you would have never dreamed of doing that. Well, I've got a little more property now to work with. Um, once I get done with it, and it should be next spring, finishing the last of the projects, 
and then it'll take a couple of years for those projects to mature. At that point, this uh, this property is going to be literally twice as good as it was. And, and you mentioned my career, Terry. I'm going to kind of go down a rabbit hole in a different direction here for a second. You know, I, I turned 60 this coming week, and I was talking to Kyle Harmon on his podcast um, about that. And, you know, he was asking, you know, where do I go from here? What's my the future? What's my goals for the future? And this and that. And I told him something that I probably ought to share right here is that uh, I, I know when I won't be doing this for 10 more years. I know I won't be doing this when I'm 70. So at some point, what I think is going to happen is one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be just totally disgusted with something. And I'm going to walk away from social media. I'm going to walk away from this podcast. I'm going to walk away from it all. I'm going to say, Terry, that podcast is yours. I don't care how you run it from now on. You can have guests. I'll be a guest every once in a while, but it's chasing giants with Terry Peer now because, uh, and I don't know if it's going to be a year from now or five years from now or seven years from now, but sometime in the next 10 years, I'm just going to one day wake up and say it's done. It's not going to, it's not going to be an announcement. This is my last year. It's going to be, okay, I've had a gut full. Um, the, the, the crap I put up with this week with haters, I dealt with haters every single day this week. People that I've never met, people that I've never talked to, I've never did anything to, posting crap about me day after day. The day's coming when I'm walking away from it all. Yep. It's frustrating, that's for sure, but... I think there's uh, probably about 35,000 listeners right here that are hoping that day is closer to the 10 year than tomorrow. So we'll just see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> my rant's over for <laughs> my rant's over and, and I'm not mad either. I'm just saying that, you know, I've accomplished basically everything I ever wanted to and more. And, uh, I would love to to help people out. I, I'd love to just turn the podcast over to you at some point and say, it's yours. I don't care what you do with it. You know, the spon- you mm-hmm. take the sponsors and, and I'll, I'll show up as a guest once a month or however often you want me. But, uh, I got a feeling just, both, the, I got a feeling that both the sponsors and the listeners are like, if Don's not there, we're not listening. So they're not here <laughs> for me, but I don't think that'll happen. <laughs> they're not yeah. here for me let's just leave it at that everywhere i go they want to know where's terry well um i was almost on the verge of having to get bailed out of jail if i would have found that dude that beat that pregnant woman <laughs> today so let's move I on to the first question of the night and uh, get going on those <laughs> okay the first one comes from alex baines from st louis missouri he says hi don and terry Thank you for the time you take to stimulate questions and conversations for the education of hunters like myself. My question relates to long-term habitat management. Everyone I listen to is talking about planting fall plots and gearing up for this year's deer season, but many of us are just beginning the journey of our land management. What would be your priorities right now to set yourself up for success next year? I have created new space for plots this year and worked on my soil, weed, and timber management. I feel like I continue to run into the issue of you should have done this or that last year to be ready this year. Any advice on things we can do in summer, early fall to set ourselves up for success the following year is greatly appreciated. Well, you know, Alex, what I would encourage you or, or anyone in your position to do, actually anyone that owns a hunting property or manages a hunting property, is either take an aerial of that property or just a piece of paper and on that aerial mark that what you want that property to look like when it's done. Um, every project that you ever want to complete on that property, mark it on there. Or take a piece of paper and just list them. You know, I want to plant a fruit orchard at certain location i want to do a tsi cut or a timber harvester i want to clear another plot here there whatever just make your entire list and then as quickly and as efficiently as possible get that list done um even if it requires some work you know right before deer season or in deer season get it done get it all done as quick as you can and then back out of your property and let it just let it rest and, and I think that is the best way, you know, 
building a really good property, you, you got to lay a foundation. So all those projects that you're doing is the foundation. You build that foundation and then you get out and, and just let it mature. And as those uh, projects, you know, your fruit tree plantings, as they mature, start producing fruit. As you do your TSI cut and the sunlight gets in there and it thickens up, over time it's going to get better and better, especially once you take that human intrusion out of the, out of the, the uh, equation. So get your projects done as quick as possible. Get out, stay out, but obviously you're going to hunt it during hunting season. You know, um, I, I wrote a, or read an article this week that Wes Delks wrote for uh, the new Whitetail Life magazine. And, uh, you know, he bought that new farm in Indiana, and he's had it for two hunting seasons, and he has not yet hunted that farm in two seasons he's staying totally out during hunting season to let the local deer learn that during hunting season that's the safest place in the whole neighborhood to be and he, he's getting a lot of habitat projects done in the off season and uh i i think he's pretty much about done with his habitat projects and but that that would be my advice for you or anyone else that owns a hunting property i've really struggled with this this year um because my uh, spring and late winter schedule was so nasty. I'm, I'm behind, but you know, I'm on chasing giants TV. We're, we're talking about all these projects there every weekend. And tomorrow we're setting a 360 blind two weeks before opening day of, of Kentucky. But I don't think, I think what people don't understand is exactly what you said. Number one, I don't hunt that farm very much. And this is a long-term play. I, if I had a shooter on that farm, I wouldn't be doing this, these type of projects, but I, mm -hmm. I'm in, I'm in the, um, I, I'm blessed to be able to have other places to hunt and another target buck that is not on that farm. So something might show up. I'm not saying it won't, but I'm not scared to go in there right now because the projects that I'm working on that we're kind of talking about on the show or on the YouTube channel is going to be for, you know, three and four years from now was setting this up, but I, I do wish that I could have done these in January and February. <laughs> don't, don't make mm -hmm. any mistake about that, but it is what it is. We all have, you know, obligations that we have to work with, but you know, th this young man, I'm guessing that he's younger. Um, and he was talking about, you know, what he can do this time of year. And it's not probably what he was asking for, but um, Alex, I would tell you to really pay attention to the wind this year. And as you're making that long-term plan on the property, really watch when you're in the stand this year, how deer are using the wind direction for where they're coming out of bedding. Because as you do long-term plans to it, you might want to manipulate that bedding to have it in a certain spot where a predominant wind that you have in your area 70% of the time, you have more likelihood to be able to hunt it with no intrusion. This, this one comes along from this, Denson. This one's yeah, along Denson the same lines, Park. I think. Matthews, Alabama. He says, Don and Terry, first, thank you for being an inspiration to so many young people, including myself. Being in my early 20s, I've started getting really interested in land management, and you both have influenced that passion greatly. On the topic of eliminating human intrusion, I know and believe that is one of the top priorities to being a successful hunter. My question is, when you are trying to keep human intrusion to a minimum, when do you go on your property to try to get something done? I put up stands and make land improvements before it starts greening up. I go in and plant spring and fall food plots. I put up cameras late summer. I plant trees in the winter. That seems like a lot of human intrusion. How do I make all these improvements while eliminating human intrusion? Well, then, so, you know, every, every project you do is going to, put some human intrusion on your property the key is where is that human intrusion when you're planting a food plot you sh your food plot should not be in your sanctuary um, the first thing that you should do on a, any hunting property is establish a sanctuary everybody gets hung up on creating food sources and food plots and planting fruit trees and you know water holes and this and that the first thing you should do on on any hunting property is designate a sanctuary area and then do whatever you need to to make the cover within that sanctuary the best that it can be. 
And then once you get that done, then you can move to the outer areas outside of that sanctuary and complete your other projects. Um, you know, when I go on a consulting visit to look at a property, the first thing I'm looking for every time is where are we going to put the sanctuary? And that should be everyone's first step. Where are you going to put your sanctuary? And then once you do that, get whatever you need to be doing inside that sanctuary, get it done. You need to harvest timber, harvest that timber. TSI, cut your, cut your, do your TSI cut. You need to plant switchgrass, get your switchgrass planted. Those should be at the top of your priority list. And then you move out away from that sanctuary and where human intrusion is not near as big a deal. I think there's probably a lot of people guilty of not doing that. They they immediately go to food plots and tree stands and then work yep. back, backwards and um, makes it a whole lot tougher. But start with your, your, your sanctuary is your foundation or your whole hub. And where you create that sanctuary in that bedding area, like I just said in the last question, it's so strategic. Once you understand how a buck's using the wind then you can you can specifically lay out that property to where you have access to you know hopefully more wind directions with good access so right. I, I think i think people many times probably do it opposite they go in and just say here we're going to put food in or a corn pile here and, and hunt over it and hope the deer come to us um probably a little bit backwards wildlife farming is the leading e-commerce platform specializing in habitat management equipment our mission is to make available the equipment necessary for the development of wildlife habitat and improve conservation for hunting and recreational property. We carry flagship brands like the Genesis Drill and Goliath Roller, as well as the premier brands in planting, mowing, spraying, forestry management, and fencing equipment. Food plot and habitat goals vary. Wildlife Farming is the company that can deliver the equipment to achieve these goals. Equipment is our specialty. Our staff is trained and familiar with all the tractor and skid steer brands to make sure you get the right piece of equipment to get the job done right the first time. At Wildlife Farming, we only sell quality equipment and we have the support and expertise you need. Please visit wildlifefarming.com for all of your equipment needs. All right. The uh, next one comes from Tom Hauk. I hope I said your name right, Tom, from Fort Wayne, Indiana. It says, hello, Don and Terry. I was listening to your question and answer segment, and the listener had mentioned being surrounded by non-resident hunters, and that could be causing the problem with lack of big deer to hunt. I am a non-resident landowner in Illinois. I do everything in my power on my little piece I can to benefit the deer so I may have a chance at shooting a giant. So I guess my question would be, who is going to be more particular on the deer they harvest? The guy who pays $1,000 a year in tags to hunt Illinois, not to mention land payments and land improvement costs, or the resident who pays $25 for his tag and is on a permission piece with no monetary responsibility. I think a lot of residents don't take into consideration what a non-resident goes through or sacrifices just to hunt another state sometimes i didn't mean to ramble i would just like your input on the resident versus non-resident conflict thanks for your time and always enjoy your podcast well tom i don't think there should be a resident versus non-resident conflict i've been a non-resident in, in numerous states as a hunter i've i've hosted numerous non-resident hunters on my farm um I, I get exactly what you're talking about if uh y you know the issues that that i've had locally um with deer management issues th there's never ever well i take that back one time there was a group of non-residents that, that showed up on a neighboring farm and, and went basically wherever they wanted they, they had a place to park their truck but that that's nothing compared to what I've seen the residents do over the years. Uh, the, the residents are, and, and you hit the nail on the head. Any guy that goes to another state pays a ridiculous amount for a tag, the travel expenses, the motel or whatever to stay there. That guy's serious. He, he's not coming to, to be a, a nuisance. He's not coming to, you know, with the Brown it's down mentality. Um, he's typically a, a serious deer hunter and, uh, he, he's not the problem. 
Um, typically, and, and that doesn't mean all residents are the problem either. There's there's plenty of residents managing land right out their back door that are doing a fantastic job as well. So the idea that it's residents versus non-residents, I think, is a bunch of garbage. What it is is serious deer hunters and land managers versus the, the base. I don't even want to call them weekend warriors because a weekend warrior can still be a legal ethical hunter. It's the the lawless. If it's brown, it's down. Kill them at any cost. Crowd uh, that I have the issue with. And, and you know, as, as I say that, I, I think things are not near as bad as they were like 25, 30 years ago. I, I think they're actually better today. Um, I remember back in the day when during shotgun season when it opened, it was just like a absolute free for all out there. There was groups of hunters everywhere having drives they some of them didn't even care if they if you could be sitting in your tree and blaze orange and if they had permission to be on the property they didn't even have any respect they just have a drive right underneath you i had that happen way back in the day and uh i think it the days of of the wild west type um deer hunting have settled down some i don't think it's near as crazy as it was 25 or 30 years ago which is a really good thing but um, I just don't see the issue with residents versus non-residents. I've been both. When I've been a non-resident, I, I never ran into someone who had a ad- bad attitude towards me because I was a non-resident. When I brought non-residents to my house as, as guests to hunt with me, I don't know that any of them were mistreated just because of where they were from. So you know, we just need yeah. to look at each other. And I think it, it all comes down to the golden rule. You treat others yeah. the way you want to be treated. It doesn't matter if they're deer hunters or just some person you see at Walmart, you know, treat people with respect. I just don't think you can stereotype it between non-resident and resident. You're either dialed into this or you're not. I mean, think about it. If you were a, if you were a property owner trying to manage it, would you rather have me and Patrick hunting next to you or some local? I mean, it, it's... Uh, you could have both sides and then to their defense you have guys from say virginia south carolina florida that come into the midwest every year with the dreams of killing a 130 you know they pay all that money because they're never going to get a buck that big at home um so you can have both sides to both residents and non-residents so it's it's whether you're dialed into this or not and it's 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 funny the the conversation we had last week with joe on the show about um what was it co-ops and it's like Mm -hmm. the theory's great but there's just so few applications where it's really going to work uh next one comes from caleb miller from millersburg ohio says hello don and terry thanks for the great podcast love listening to it was curious on your input about this would you rather have 1000 continuous acres or 10 different 100-acre farms spread throughout a certain area. Well, Caleb, we've talked about this before, but it's been a while, and we got a lot of new listeners, so I thought it'd be good to to hit on it again. I would much rather have the 10 100-acre farms. And, uh, you know, I didn't – I used to say I would rather have five 80-acre tracks instead of a 400-acre track. I didn't even have a 1,000. And the reason for that is those smaller tracks, if they are laid out right, you should be able to get some of the biggest bucks in that area around that 100 acres to bed on your 100. Well, that gives, if you've got five or 10 or however many smaller tracks scattered about, not real close together, then you're really pulling from a different deer herd on each property. And your odds of finding a giant on five properties in five different areas are way better than on one property, no matter how big it is. Because no matter how big that property is, you're going to have, you're going to lose bucks. I don't care if it's 10,000 acres. The bucks that live on the outer edges are going to, going to leave and get shot, some of them. So that that's my, I mean, I, I'm even looking at some really small properties to potentially purchase just so i mean i'm losing permission properties right and left every year i'm losing at least one or two i'm to the point where i'm either going to have to and you can't find them to lease you just can't i've been looking for years i put ads out 
looking for for leases and i'm just gonna and i'm talking there's one property i'm looking at to try to buy that's seven acres but if i can get that seven acres and set it up i know that i can hold at least one good buck there a year now is he going to be good enough that i want to shoot him maybe maybe not i'd say most years probably not but i'm gonna if i get several of those scattered about you know over a three county area or whatever then i should have a good buck to hunt every single year it's just you're you're increasing your sample size exponentially Mm -hmm. a bigger track of land you have what deer deer there you get a bunch of of different properties out your sample size just goes way up for the deer that could be potentially on that those smaller farms you know we talk about ranges and how a property is either on the edge of a range or it's in the core of the range all of that traffic going to and fro uh you know throughout the season um just gives you more opportunities a bigger bigger sample size to select from well here's the other thing if you've got let's just say you've got a 200 inch buck and he's bedded on your property if that 200 inch buck is bedded on an 80 acre property and he's bedded there on a continual basis regular basis day after day every time you go in to hunt you should be within a, a couple hundred 300 yards or so of that buck now he may not stand up on a particular day he may lay in his bed till it's pitch black but every day you climb in a stand you should be fairly close to that buck and your odds of killing him are a whole lot better you you do the same situation on a big property a thousand acres well shoot that buck could be a half a mile or more bedded from where you're at there's no way he's going to get up and walk all that distance before dark most days it'd be very very rare so a a smaller property is way easier to hunt too yep i agree all right last one of the night Uh, This one comes from Edward Miller from Clyde, New York. He says, hello, Don and Terry. I love your podcast and look forward to it every week. I have been watching some nice bucks this summer. My question is, how much of this information of where they are and how big they are do I keep to myself without being selfish? A very respected friend told me, nothing is worth having if you can't share it. And I totally agree with that. Is it considered selfish if I don't tell people, including friends? Or should I protect my favorite spot by not telling people? I'm a teenager and want to start out doing the right thing. Thank you both for your information. I wish you lots of luck this season, Edward. Well, Edward, um, there's probably going to be some adults that don't like my answer. But I'm telling you what, to find a mature buck takes effort. It, It takes, you know, what I did tonight, getting out sitting in the weeds on a hot muggy evening with bugs crawling all over me sweating hoping that i get a a, a look at a a good buck it's going to take uh buying trail cameras the work that you have to put in to get a job and make the money and buy trail cameras and batteries the effort that you go put in to go out and check those trail cameras and everything else i don't think it's a bit selfish to keep all that information to yourself not a bit selfish um if your buddy if he goes out and buys a new motorcycle is it okay for you to show up and walk into his garage and take his motorcycle and and take it out for a ride now sure he may let you take it for a short ride but i'm talking about anytime you want you just show up and you jump on his motorcycle and you take it different people have different priorities they have different interests if anyone else is super interested in shooting big deer they have the opportunity to go out and, and just like you do, just like I do, to, to put the effort in to find those deer. Those of us who do it have no obligation to anyone else to, to share that information with them. Now, whether you, you do or not, it's fine. That's totally your choice. If, if you want to share it with your buddies, that's great. But if you do not share it with them, that does not make you selfish in my book. Share the back straps with them after you kill it. there you go best advice we've heard yet yeah i mean it's it's i i think i understand what the uh the friend of edward is is trying to say you know if if you it goes back to you know servant leadership you always try to help others but 
to say that every aspect of your life you have to give up and let everybody else, you know, you know I, I don't think you should feel guilty about pursuing a dream or a passion and, uh, you know, not not including everybody on every single aspect of what you're doing. Don't don't feel guilty about that. But I do think that you need to always live your life trying to help others. You're going to be blessed more if you do that. But, right. A good well, question. Do- I, that, that's kind of odd. We had two younger guys ask more philosophical questions tonight than we've had. Um, that's that's kind of new. So we appreciate the young listeners. It's odd that like we're the that. old geezers uh, trying to give advice. At least it is for me. Maybe not you. Well, I, I'm definitely you, an old geezer, no doubt. You're, you're it, turning but, uh, 60 this week. Yeah, and that puts me over the hill for sure. I've been over the hill for a while. Now I'm I'm rolling down pretty fast to the bottom. But, uh, you know, it's no different than if, Edward, if you would go out and, and get a job and make money, are you obligated to, to share the, the money you make at your job? No, there, there's certain things you're not obligated to share, and it does not make you selfish. It, it's about ambition. So don't feel bad if you keep it to yourself. Share the back straps after you kill him. That's right. Let your buddy be in the picture with it when you're holding the rack up. How about that? <laughs> All right, Don. Well, um, this this is going to air Sunday. It's Friday night now. It's really late. Um, I'm not even going to edit this tonight. I'm going to go straight to bed. We got a big day tomorrow with Austin on the farm. Um, you're going to turn 60 before the next episode. What do you got planned? Now we're going out uh, with the kids tomorrow night for supper, so uh, that's about it. I think you should do a uh, 60th birthday post of you with a sleeveless T-shirt and a pair of shorts standing outside in the driveway. I think you should do that. I'm sitting here recording this. It's late at night, and I took a shower right before. (laughs) You don't have no drawers on, do you? I'm sitting here in my underwear recording this. (laughs) I'm tempted just to stick my white legs up in the air, Terry. <laughs> but I'm afraid we'd lose too many listeners if I do that. So I'm going to just uh, sit here and pretend like I've got pants on. Well, I can't honestly say I've never done the same thing sitting behind this desk. So it's like the uh, it's like the news anchors back in the day where they had a suit on the top half and basketball shorts and sneakers on the bottom half. But Yep. Yeah, let's 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 keep your separate tech underwear out of the uh, frame for tonight. How about that? I'm afraid we'd lose too many listeners if I stuck my <laughs> legs up. <laughs> Ray and Aiden are going to have a field day with this. Our phone is going to absolutely oh, blow up. Yeah, I forgot about them guys. Good grief. They're, they'll never let me hear the end of it. Yeah, especially well, after especially after your comments to him this week. That was funny. <laughs> Ray and Aiden, well, we I love you guys. You better one. <laughs> <laughs> all right well we appreciate everybody's help remember that event in sept on september 12th we need you R- rsvp and then uh, do us a favor go out and visit the whitetail master academy if you want to start watching the chasing giants youtube or excuse me if you want to start watching the chasing giants podcast on the whitetail master academy it's there you do not have to be a member to, if you want to watch it on another platform other than youtube and um go out and subscribe to the chasing giants tv youtube channel it really help us out and get that off the ground uh pre-order shirts are about ready to close and this week don we should have osseo camo real world hats on the website and then here in just a week or two we'll have chasing giants osseo hats ready for hunting season so stay tuned for that we'll let everybody know when they're available god bless everyone have a great week Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, by a farm real estate company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.